Okay. So this week, let's go back to the top. We talk about functions. Module 5 is all about giving your code a name because that's really what functions are. And I have to talk about my favorite topic, which is reusability, because functions make your code even more re reusable than loops. Um, so just a quick go over for reusability. It, it allows you to not copy and paste your code. If you have, if you're not copying and pasting your code, you have an opportunity to reduce the total amount of code that you write. And that's good. That's good for you. That's good for the person paying you. You won't have to maintain as much and they won't have to pay for as many lines of code. And now we give reusability a name because that's what we're doing. We are taking a block of code and we're giving it a name and we're giving ourselves the ability to send data into that block of code and get data out of that block of code. Now there are some new concepts that we have to deal with and some new keywords that we need to deal with. So um, we're going to deal with the keyword death. And we're going to deal with some other concepts like mutability and the concept of a return because return is also a keyword. And we'll go into all of that. But that's what we're doing. We're giving our code a name. We're giving our block of our code a name. So function basics. We're grouping our code. It's a named group. And if I can't say name enough, I probably will make you sick of it this, this lecture. Um, but basically what we're doing is we're taking a grouping of code, grouping of script lines, that have a common function, a common mission, and putting them together with a name. And then I can use it again and again and again. And functions, if you, if you ever look at a module in Python, if you look at the math module, um, if you look at, they've got game modules like Pygame, what you'll see is you'll see objects and functions in those modules. So this is really the, the beginning of our ability to create libraries of code. Because you can write li a library of code, a bunch of different functions, and then give it to somebody else to use. Use it yourself. An example is um, I do some penetration testing for the product that we write. And recently, and, and I haven't, I don't get to spend a lot of time designing or doing this code because it's just kind of a, I have to get this done. I had a little time the other day. And I actually restructured all the code into objects, which have, and we'll find out more about that on week eight, but the important part is I encapsulated it and all of the functionality is in functions. Now, I just use the word encapsulation. What does encapsulation mean? Really what encapsulation means is that you're drawing a box around a group of code, and you're shading that out. Nobody has to know what happens inside that box. The only thing they have to know is that there's a function with that name, with a name, maybe, and you've described what it's supposed to do, that there's going to be some data you can put in and data the function will give back. But you've encapsulated it inside this thing called a function. So nobody else has to know what that code is. You just have to know that it's there and whether or not it's useful to them. And we're also in week eight going to talk a lot more about encapsulation because we're going to start using objects. But functions will be used in objects so this is, this is a good precursor to that. Okay, so what's a function? Let's look at it through Python. And by the way, this particular and the next couple of slides are going to be using challenge 5.1.1 as the example. So I have a keyword called def, D-E-F. What def does 
is it says Python, do not run the lines of code that are indented underneath me until somebody actually calls my name. That's what DEF does. So DEF allows you to kind of take that block of code, name it, and store it. You're going to store it in a code closet. And then later on, you can pull it out of the code closet. But you don't have to pull all the lines of code out. All you have to do is call it by name, and Python will do the rest. So DEF is the keyword that starts off all functions. The next thing you have here is the name. Function names have the same or similar, very similar rules to variable naming. So if you wouldn't name a variable. If you can't name it a variable the way you're trying to name it, you can't name a function either. Um, basically, alphanumerics has to start with an alpha, um, can contain underscores, can't contain spaces, can, can, is case sensitive like everything else in Python. So here we have the def keyword, and to the right of that, separated by a single space, is print underscore pattern. So print underscore pattern is the name of the function, and that is what we will use to call it. Then um, underneath the print pattern is going to be the block of code. I did this in the wrong order. I should have done the parentheses first, but I didn't. So a function contains a block of code. It is one to n number of lines. However many of number of lines you need, you can have in a function. After the function name, you at minimum have to have an open and close parenthesis. Now I say at minimum because there's more stuff we're going to put in there soon. And then, of course, you have your colon. Don't forget the colon. This is telling Python that there's a block of code to expect. And if you forget that colon, you're going to get all kinds of weird syntax errors because we know how bad programmers are at writing errors and programmers write programming language. So you won't get good error messages from that. But that's what a function is. This is a very simple function. We're going to define some more complex functions. And in one of your labs, you're going to define a relatively complex function. So rule number one, a function declaration is started with the keyword def. And that's what this is right here. When you see def print pattern and, that, and all of that, this is a function declaration. You're not running it. You're declaring it. A function requires at minimum an opening, uh, open and closing parenthesis. So we're back to this challenge again. And I've defined my function. But that's all I've done. It's not going to be run. And we're going to go out and look at the code in a second. And I'll help you understand what that means a little better. So I have my function, def print pattern. And now, later on in my script, I'm calling print underscore pattern, open and close parentheses. And what that tells Python to do is go look for a function called print pattern, and whatever happens inside that function, do it. That's what Python does. So this is a function call. They are case and space sensitive. So if it doesn't have an underscore, it's not the same. If there's a capital P in print in your call and a lowercase p in print in your definition, it's not going to work. It's, so they're all the same rules like variables, but now you're defining a function. So if I look at this and I call print pattern, Python's going to go find print pattern. It's going to execute what's inside of it. And so it's going to print out to the screen five stars, and then it's going to be done. But I can call print pattern again. I can call print pattern as many times as I want. Okay, so there's a second function called the print pattern. Going back up to the top, Python's going to find it. It's going to say, okay, I have found print pattern, and it's going to print it again. And 
and you can just keep doing this over and over again. The nice part about calling a function is you don't have to worry about all those lines of code. Somebody else has written that code and hopefully tested it really well so that when you call it, all you have to do is give it the data that you want to give it and get back what you're hoping to get back. Now, there's no data currently in this. There's just opening and closing parentheses, and I'm printing something. This is very simple, and it um, it doesn't really, it, it, this is our introduction to the syntax, because you, this is not a complex problem or complex solution to a problem. And what we will see more complex ones soon. So you have to define a function before you call it. If print underscore pattern does not exist as a function call, before you call it, Python's going to give you an error. Um, you're going to call a function by using its name. And a function call tells Python to run the code inside the function definition. So now let's go take a look at, yes. Oh, thank you very much, Harold. Why does it recommend that both variables and functions are all lowercase and C functions are title case? I don't know why it recommends that, Harold. I, I, I spend a lot of time in Java and I tend to do camel case. Um, it just is the way people do it sometimes. Functionally, there is no, functionally it doesn't matter. If you want to do lowercase with underscores, you can do lowercase with underscores. If you want to do camel case, you can do camel case. Um, will we ever be able to use user input in a function call? Yes, and we're going to see that in just a few minutes. Um, we're going to see lots of examples of that. Um, this is just the very, very beginning of how to define a function. So I'm going to bring up PyCharm and opened up. This is our very simple, and I can't seem to, there we go. So this is 511. Um, it's print pattern, and I'm just going to run this. And you'll see here, instead of just calling it once, I call it in a loop, because you can call functions in a loop. You can call functions in diff blocks. Um, so I'm going, let me do this, and create a new configuration. And I want to show you specifically here what I mean by defining it and calling it. So I'm going to use my handy dandy and favorite tool, the debugger. And you will notice that my blue line is on line six. Never stopped at line three. It's on line six. And that's because this def told Python, read the lines, but don't execute them. Only execute them once they're called. Best practices, um, there are certain things, Patrick, about best practices. Some best practices are flavor rather than function. I, I, uh, I divide computer concepts into two things. There's flavor and there's function. Flavor is whether or not you use camel case or underscores or dashes or whatever. That is the look and feel of it. And it's secondary to whether or not your code behaves exactly as you need your code to behave. So I, I personally could care less if somebody uses camel case or if somebody uses all lowercase and underscores. Doesn't matter to me at all. It's a personal coding choice. What I care about is the code inside that named thing. 
works as well as it needs to. So um, there are some best practices that are extraordinarily important. Okay, there's a, a, a book called Design Patterns, which was originally written for C and C++. They have Java design patterns. They have all kinds of design patterns. These design patterns are considered best practices when you are trying to um, solve certain kinds of common problems or have certain kinds of common requirements. Those are not flavor. Those are very important best practices and they should be followed. And for anybody out there who is thinking about going into computer programming as a profession, I would always recommend evaluating best practices. If you're going to have to go out and write something, look for Java best practices. Look for Python design patterns and best practices. And understand that some best practices are really nice opinion from some people, but have nothing to do with how the code behaves. Always concentrate more on how the code behaves. You can change a name later. If somebody really has, you know, heartburn over the way you have named something, it's a name. But the functionality is what's important. So I'll get off my soapbox now, and I will go back to 5.1.1. .1. Um, so we will notice that I did not stop on line three. I didn't stop on line three because Python didn't execute any code yet. It simply read it and stored it. So now I'm on line six, okay? Line six is just a, a, a for loop in range two. So I'm going to step into my for loop, which is zero, and now I'm gonna call print pattern. So if I um, mouse over print pattern in PyCharm, PyCharm will tell me that it is a function and that it even has a memory address. That memory address is where Python is going to go to execute the code. So it read it, it stored it, gave it a, an, ad, an address in that storage, which is what that at hexadecimal met, or, yeah, um, means. So how do I see what happens? If I step over it, I'm going to end. Can everybody see? Um, so instead, I've got this new little arrow here, and that is step into. If I want to see what's going on in a function, I step into the function. So I'm going to step into it. Lo and behold, I am at line three now because Python has been told to execute the code inside the function. I'm going to step over. You'll see on the console that I printed five things. I'm going to, now I'm at one. I'm going to step in again. I'm at line three. And I'm done. So let's see. Yeah, whoever is not muted, I think I may go out and find you and mute you. Who's not muted? I think everybody muted. Okay, everybody, thank you for muting. So now, let's go to the next phase. Now we're going to talk about how to get data into a function. So this is called parameters. So we have parameters and arguments. Parameters are variables that are uh, accessed in the scope of the function, and we're going to talk a little bit more about scope in a few minutes. Sorry, that's just Alexa. If you guys are hearing something, for some reason Alexa decided to talk. Um, sorry. So anyway, there are parameters and arguments. Parameters allow you to pass data into a function. So you can do things like print the total inches calculate the area of a pyramid, um, you know, square. You can square some numbers because you have like, or square root in the math module. Um, create a pattern for regular expressions. All of those, 
excuse me, our, um, our functions to take parameters. So what's a parameter? First of all, parameters are used in functions. So you won't find them anywhere else unless you're defining a function. We then have the name of our function, same syntax as before. We're going to have an open parenthesis, and then we're going to have a couple of parameters. Now those parameters are always going to be separated by a comma. The comma is very important, and if you don't have it, you'll get weird error messages, and I'll show you what those error messages will be. And then it is closed with a closing parenthesis, and then you never, of course, forget your colon. After that, there is a code block that will be executed. And so that's basically how you define a function with parameters. It's not how you call it, but it's how you define it. So you've still got def, you've still got a function name, you still have your opening and closing parentheses, you still have that colon at the end. In the middle of those parentheses is where you name your parameters. That parameter is actually a variable name. It's a variable name that can be accessed within that function only. And it is, allows you to send data in. So it exists only inside the function, and it's provided the value for that variable is provided in the function call. So let's go take a look at 5.2.3, and now we have Professor Lisa over here testing her students' code. So what am I going to do? I have two input statements. I have num feet and num inches. So I'm going to input the number of feet, and I'm going to input the number of inches. Those are just standard input statements. We convert them to an int using the int function. We've done this since week one. So there's nothing special about that. However, in the next line, there is something special. Because what I am doing now is I am sending num feet and num inches. I'm sending the, the value of 5, which is num feet, and the value of 8, which is num inches, and I'm going to send it to the print total inches function. And I do that by using the arguments num feet, or using the arguments num feet and num inches. So num feet goes to num feet, num inches goes to num inches, and then I can do my calculation. Num feet is 5, num inches is 8, 5 times 12 plus 8 is going to be 68. That seems reasonable, simple enough, but now we have to understand that arguments are positional. The fact that the first argument is named num feet has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the first parameter in the function definition is num feet. It doesn't make any difference. These are passed by value, not passed by reference. So an argument is a value that is passed into a function. A function call must have the same number of arguments as parameters in the function definition, at least for now. So I have num feet and num inches, so I have two parameters, which means my call to it has two arguments. Has to happen. And if that doesn't happen, then I'm going to get an error. And when we go out and we look at this code, I'll mess things up and show you guys the errors. So now, order. Order is important because order determines what is going to happen when. So I now have my print total inches function. I'm taking two, I have two parameters, num feet and num inches. And then down here on my to print total inches function call, I have two arguments. Simple enough. So what happens if I change those arguments? If I call it with num inches and then num feet? Well, let's see what happens. Num feet is 5, num inches is 8. Num feet is 5, num inches is 8. That hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is how I send them into the function. So num feet actually is 
the second parameter because it's positional. Num inches is actually the first, the value that's going to be passed into the first parameter because that's, um, it's, that's its position. So we're going to now do 8 times 12 plus 5. So when I do this, we're going to have 8 and we're going to have 5 here. And my answer is going to change. It's no longer 68. It's 101. And the only thing I did was change num inches and num feet. So the names of the arguments have nothing to do with the names of the parameters. It is strictly by position. Arguments are positional. Change the order of the arguments and you possibly will change the outcome of the function. Okay, so let's go out and look at that. Yes. Yes, you can. You can put input into a function call. You can call another function from a function and I think that we, I, there is an actual example in tonight's lecture. Um, oh, I said Alexa and yours went off too. And I think mine just went off again. I shouldn't have used that word. I apologize. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Shouldn't have used that word. Okay, so we're going to do 5.2.3, and here is our total inches. And I'm going to I'm going to run this through, and I'm going to mess some things up so we can start seeing errors because understanding why you're getting an error is um, as important as understanding how the logic should flow. Because if you're constantly getting errors, you're just going to get frustrated. So here I have defined print total inches and I have my input for num feet and num inches and then I'm going to call print total inches and then I'm going to call it swapped. So I am going to, let me set my configuration. This is 2, 3. Okay. So I'm just going to start by debugging. So I'm going to enter the number of feet. Let's just say I'm going to 10 feet. And I'm going to input the number of inches. And I'm going to say it's 12 inches. And now I'm going to call my function. So I'm going to go in. If I'm debugging and I want to see what happens inside the function, I select step into down here. So I'm going to step into. Now I'm actually running that code. So if I look over here in PyCharm, again, it's very handy. I have num feet is 10 and num inches is 12. And so num feet, num inches, as I step over inside the function, I see that total inches is 132. And I'm going to print it. And then I'm going to do this again, but the only thing I did was I swapped num inches and num feet. So that is the only thing that changed. My function definition, the block of code in the function, my inputs, nothing else has changed but the order in which I have given it the variables. So I'm going to step into this again. And now we see that num feet up here is 12. And num inches inside the function call is 10, which means I'm going to have 154 as my answer. I'm going to print it, and I'm done. So now I'm going to break some things so we can see what happens. First, I'm going to get rid of the handy-dandy colon. And I'm going to run it, and I have syntax error, invalid syntax. This is one of the few times that Python is probably going to tell you exactly where the problem is. 
The problem is that I removed the colon. So let's put the colon back. And then I'm going to remove the comma. And I get an invalid syntax again. Now it's telling me num underscore inches is the invalid syntax. However, that's not the case. We just need to look back a second and realize that there's no comma between them. So now let's see what happens if I call it without the right number of arguments. So let's see what happens if I do this. Well, I'm going to print, I'm going to enter 10, and I'm going to enter 9, and then I get a type error missing one required positional argument, num inches. So it's telling me that I have not given it enough arguments. So if I put num inches here, let me do it again and see what Python tells me. So I'm going to run it, I'll put 10 and 9, and here I have, takes two positional arguments, but three are given. So this is telling me I have too many. The last one was telling me I had too few. This one's telling me I have too many. It's expecting two, I gave it three, and I'm not allowed to do that. At least not just yet. So those are some ways to mess up. And here's another way we can mess up. Okay? All I did was backspace the total inches. If I run this again, I don't even get to the point where I put the input statements in. Python is reading it. It's checking for valid syntax, and it's saying, hey, wait a minute, I have an indentation error. Because, as with everything else in Python that requires a code block, the code block has to be indented by one. So if def is at the very left-hand column, I have to tab once to make sure that my code is indented properly. And if there's an if statement, I might have to indent more if there are code blocks inside my code block. But for right now, understand that if it ends with a colon, if whatever you're doing in Python ends with a colon, the next line needs to be tabbed in. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to do that. Now, you'll see that total inches all of a sudden went red. And that is because print total inches is no longer considered inside the function. By tabbing this back to the left-hand side, print total inches is considered in a different scope. And I've talked about scope once, and we're actually going to see a slide on scope in a bit. But I've taken it out of the function. Print total inches is no longer in the function, and the variable total inches only exists inside this function. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So Python is saying, hey, wait a minute. The name total inches is not defined. So if you're looking at that error and you're saying, hey, wait a minute, I see total inches. Total inches is defined on line six. What's going on? Well, what is going on is there's an indentation error. So if I indent it in, that's fine. Now what if I get one too many? I just added a space. So see here there's no red. I add a space. What's Python going to do? Python is going to tell me that there's an unexpected indent. So this is the time when we really have to start being very aware of our spaces and our tabs. So just because I put a single space in front of that print, all of a sudden my code goes out of whack and Python gives me a syntax error. So we have to be careful. Now, what happens if I tab in numpy? Well, all of a sudden, numfeet goes red. Numfeet goes red because I have just put it inside the function. So what Python does is it says, okay, everything inside the function is tabbed in at least once. So until I hit 
another function definition or something that is tabbed all the way to the left, it's inside the function. So right now I have just taken num feet and put it inside my function. And if I run it, um, I'm going to put in 10 and then I get an error. You'll First of all, you'll notice that I didn't get asked twice. I did not get asked twice because num feet is no longer in the outer scope of the function. It's now inside print total inches. So it doesn't know num feet. Num feet doesn't exist to it. So even if you can see it on line 9, if it is indented under the def, it is inside the function. To get it outside the function, I have to then tab back one. So there's a lot of moving pieces here and there's a lot of things that can happen that can go wrong and become very frustrating for students. Sometimes they're frustrating for us programmers too. You know, if I'm having a day where my brain isn't quite as sharp as I would like it to be, I will write a bunch of code and then go back and look at it and say, wow, there's a lot of syntax errors in there. That wasn't a good idea. So that's, uh, let's see, we did argument order. Now we're going to do returns, okay? So I've gotten data to go into my function. What if I want to have data come out of my function? I want to get something that's going to say, hey, give me my information back. You, you, I want you to do this complex calculation and you have to tell me what the result is. So we do that using the return keyword. So let's start with our function definition because returns pretty much only work inside of a function. So I have a def keyword, I have function name, I have all these wonderful parameters separated by a colon, I have my parentheses, sorry, separated by a comma, I have my parentheses and my colon. Inside I have my code block. Now the difference in this code block is that I have a return keyword. That return keyword tells Python that whatever is to the right of that keyword is going to be passed out of the function. The value is going to be passed out of the function and make it usable outside the function. And that is the purpose of the return statement. The re return is saying, all these great and wonderful calculations happened in this function. Now I need to give it back to you. And that's what return does. That's, all, that's its entire purpose in Python is to send information back outside of a function. So it's used, return is used exclusively inside a function. So let's look at an example. So I have my pyramid. I've got three input statements. I'm going to input 4.5 for the length, 2.1 for the width, and 3.0 for the height. Okay, perfect. So now I can, I have length, which is going to be passed into my pyramid volume because that's the function I'm going to use. So 4.5 is the length. 2.1 is the width, and 3.0 is the height. And what's going to happen? Well, 4.5 is going to be the value for base length, 2.1 is going to be the value for base width, and 3.0 is going to be the value for pyramid height. So my beautiful calculation is going to happen. And it's going to be 9.45 for the value pyramid inside the pyramid volume function. But the return statement is going to set pyramid that is in the outer scope to 9.45. So the word pyramid after the return has nothing to do with the word pyramid after the line that has height in it. So that is what a return does. 
Call a function by using its name and providing arguments. Always remember to define a variable before the function call to use the return value. So I have the variable pyramid. It's to the right right now of the 9.45. And I have an equal sign. And then to the right of it, I have a function call. So that tells me I'm expecting the function to return something. And whatever is returned, I want it in the variable name pyramid. And then I can use that later on in the print function because it's just a variable that holds a value. So let's go out and take a look at that. Yes. Did I read somewhere that there should be two blank lines after defining a function? It looks like it's working here, but my pie charm gave me an error. Patrick, that's not really a hard and fast rule. What I like to do when I'm defining a function on my own, of my own, is I will define the function and then inside I will add comments right under the, the function that describe what that function is doing. So um, the two blank lines, um, I, I've never tried it. You can have it. Um, I don't know why your pie charm gave you an error. I don't necessarily think it's illegal. Would moving it in turn it into a local variable? Yes. We're going to talk about local scope and global scope in just a minute, Joel, but you're exactly right. Yeah, the two blank lines is for readability. Um, and that's flavor versus function. Okay, so let's go out and look at 3.3. Three. So here's our pyramid, our pyramid volume. Although, let me make that just a tad bit smaller. There we go. And set the configuration. Oh, and just to let you know, we are having storms here tonight. So if I, sorry, if I go and just kind of uh, disappear, it's because the power went off. Just wanted to let everyone know. So I have defined a function called pyramid volume, and I'm going to do some calculations. So here I'm just going to start there and so I'm going to run my handy dandy debugger and I'm going to do 10, 12, and 42 just to put something in there. So I have a length of 10, a width of 12, and a height of 42. I'm going to call pyramid volume with the length, the width, and the height. I'm going to step in to look at it. So here I can see I have a base length of 10, a base width of 12, and a base, base height of 42. So I'm going to do my handy dandy calculation, and you will see that pyramid is now 1680. So I'm going to return that value of 1680 and I come, when I step over that, I come back to line 12. Now you'll notice when I, when I hover over line 12 right now, there's nothing. And when I go into my variables, I don't have a variable named pyramid yet. And I don't have it named pyramid, I don't have a variable named pyramid yet because Python hasn't actually executed this line of code. It executed part of it by going and calling pyramid volume, but it hasn't finished the execution. So when I step over it, now pyramid has a value. And if I step over that, I'll get the printed out to my console. So that is what's happening. Now, this pyramid had nothing to do with this pyramid. I could call this XXX and call this XXX and it would all behave exactly the same. So this pyramid is simply just a value that's going to be passed back. And in this, the next case is just going to be passed into XXX. 
it doesn't matter what's on the left hand side of this single equal sign as long as it's a valid variable name. It matters that there's a valid variable name, a single equal sign, and that the function that's on the right hand side, this pyramid volume, it matters that that is going to return something because I'm going to rely on the return from that calculation. So, yeah. Oh, I hope that you're safe, Daniel. Yes, really, really windy and really, really rainy. So, we're going to talk a little bit about Python objects. Now, we're not going to start object-oriented programming this week. But we have to understand the concept of an object because of the mutability of certain variable types, the certain, certain types that we're going to talk about in a minute. So what is an object? An object is encapsulation of data and processes. An object has a type, an identity, and a value. A type can be string. A value can be 42. Um, a function is an object, OK? A string is an object. An integer is an object. Everything in Python, for the most part, is really an object. Um, but it's important to know that functions are objects and that thing, certain things you can pass in to a function is an object. And that is because of, um, well, let's just go and talk about. So the function identity is the function name. The parameters are the values, and the, the type is the return, the type of the value that you're returning. So if I were returning a string, the type for pyramid volume would be a string. If I'm returning a float, the type of pyramid volume function is float. If I'm returning Boolean, the type of the function would be Boolean. So the type of the function is based on what is being returned. And because Python is not a strongly typed language, we don't have to tell it. So you could have a function that returned bunches of different stuff. It wouldn't matter. Um, but that's why it's important to understand a function is an object, and the, the identity, the value, and the type are all part of a function, and this becomes more important in week eight, but it's still important now. So scope. We have, there are a couple of scopes in Python. We're going to concentrate on the local scope and the global scope, and there's also a built-in scope. So scope dictates where a variable is used, is, is accessible where it exists, OK? Um, there are four basic scopes. We're going to concentrate on local, global, and built-in. Local is inside of a block of code. So you can have a local scope in um, an if statement. You can have a local scope inside of a for loop. You can have a local, local scope inside of a function. And the global scope is what's outside of that, OK? So when we took a look just a minute ago and I moved things around um, in the function and I said, hey, wait a minute, that variable no longer exists because it's supposed, it thinks it's inside the function. That's because I moved it from the global scope into the local scope simply by adding a tab. It's very important to understand scopes so you understand why something is defined and why something isn't. And if you're writing larger and complex programs, you can get into a, a situation where Python is giving you an error because you have something in the global and local scope at the same time. Um, so inside a function is local, outside a function is global. The global scope cannot access anything anything that is inside a local scope. 
The local scope can access things that are inside a global scope. A function name is inside the global scope. A function parameter is inside the local scope. So it's just, it's important to understand where things sit because I often see students look at their code, think it's right, and it doesn't function properly. And that's because of the scoping of the variable that they're using. Having things in the wrong scope can cause you to have logic errors, not just syntax errors, but logic errors. Syntax errors are easy. Logic errors are hard. So a little bit more about scope. So the function name is in the global scope, period, end of sentence. Unless you're in a class, and then the class name is in the global scope, and the function name is in the class scope, is in the local scope of the class. The parameters are in the local scope. So they only exist inside the function. The process inside a function is actually inside the local scope. Global scope knows nothing about that line of code. And the return makes data from the local scope available to the global scope. So you transition from global to local scope when you call a function. So you have things, in this case, you have things, length, width, and height that are currently in the global scope. And when you call pyramid volume, base length, base width, and pyramid height have the values from length, width, and height, and those three, and base length, base, base, width, I'm going to kill myself for trying to say that, and pyramid object, all are activated in the local scope and they have the variables from length, width, and height. Okay, a function call can be called from any scope. I can call it from the global scope. I can call it from inside an if block, which would be the local scope of the if block. I can call it from inside of another function. So it would be, be called inside the local scope of the function. So I can call a function from just about anywhere. Arguments make data available from the global scope into the local scope. So Arguments and mutability. We talked about local and we talked about global, and here is why. Okay? So, and we also talked about objects, and here is why. Some objects are mutable. Lists are mutable. I can change a list. I can change a dictionary. We're going to learn a little bit more about that next week. But they're mutable, which means they are changeable. So, if I pass something that is changeable, like a list, inside a function, and I modify that list inside the function, so inside the local scope I make the modification, it will reflect, without doing a return, in the global scope. Let's see. So, teacher Lisa puts, here good things just end all. Comma separated list, or comma separ a string with commas, all comma separated. I'm going to split that into a list. That list is going to be used to call swap, the function swap. And I'm just going to be passing here good things, just end all. So I've created a list and I have passed it. Now a list is mutable, which means a list can be changed. And because it is an object, objects are passed by reference, not passed by value. So what passed by reference means is there's only one. It sits in a place where it has an address. And anything done to that is done to, is visible 
every place that had that knows about that address in memory. So I am going to do a swap. The swap is basically going to swap the first and the last elements in the list. And then I have my new list is going to be all good things just end here. And when I print, I'm going to print all good things just end here. And I didn't have a return statement. There's no return after list to swap minus one equal temp. I didn't have to because I passed an object in. The objects are passed by reference. So any change I make in the local scope will be reflected in the global scope. Now, if you have any questions, let me know. We can have a longer discussion about this in a few minutes. Because as usual, I'm running late. So if an argument is mutable, then any changes made to the value in the local scope will be reflected in the global scope. All right, so let's go out. Yes. Yes, an object sounds like a class in C and C++ and Java. Yes, that's exactly right, Harold. Okay. Um, and they're not the fully fledged object-oriented classes that we can make in C++ and that are mandated in Java. Um, but they are the beginnings of that. And in week eight, we will see the fully fleshed out class structure that you will use. So that was what? Uh, no, that's not it. Do I have that one? That's pyramid volume. Well, I don't think I have that one. My apologies, I don't have that one. But I will um, put it up. So, default parameters. I will, I will put um, that challenge up with the, uh, in the description of the video. So, here I have my parameter values. I have a function called num number of pennies. And I have two parameters. I have dollars and pennies. Wait a minute. Pennies has this equal zero after it. What in the world am I doing? This is called a default parameter value. And I can, and I, I often do in my Python code, set default parameter values. Because maybe I don't always want to pass in dollars and pennies. Maybe I just want to pass in dollars. And if I have pennies, I'll pass in pennies. Um, it gives you an option to somewhat have a variable argument length, at least in the calling aspect. But that's how you, that's the syntax of it, pennies equals zero. Or my, whatever your parameter is, equal, and then a value. So if I want to print number of pennies into input, and that, by the way, I can put the input right in the call to number of pennies. I'm going to put four. And that four is going to go to dollars. Now, there's a definite order here. You cannot have, your, your function definition cannot have uh, parameters with default values before parameters without default values. You always have to have all the parameters without default variables before any parameter with default values. So I only put in one value that I'm passing to number of pennies because dollars doesn't have a default value and it is the first place in the list, it gets four. So four and then pennies is going to be zero, so I'm going to say 400, and that's what's going to be returned. So now, can I call it with pennies? Yes. I can call it with two input statements. And again, here's an example of where I have the input right inside the function call to number of pennies. 
I can call a function from within another function. I can call a function as an argument to another function. And in this case, I'm calling two functions as an argument because I'm calling input and then I'm putting it through int to change it from a string to an integer. So here I'm going to use 5. 5 is going to be the first argument. 6 is going to be the second argument. In this case, 5 is going to be dollars because it's the first argument. 6 is going to be pennies because it's the second argument. 0 doesn't matter because I passed in a value. So I'm going to have 506 returned. So that is how you use parameters with default values. And what do they do? They just make it so that sometimes you don't have to put in a piece of information if you don't have it. Nobody else in the world has to remember that the default pennies is zero. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me as the person who's calling it. All I have to know is that I have to have a number of dollars. If I don't have pennies, it doesn't matter. I don't have to remember that the default should be zero. That's defined into the function. Um, let's see. Yes, parameters with default values have to be listed at the end. They have to be listed after parameters without default values. Okay, one of the cool things about Python is multiple return statements. Python is one of the few languages that does not require you to have a structure it, to, to return something. You can just return a comma-separated list of things and have on the left-hand side of the function call a comma separated list of variables and it will simply put them into the right place. What am I talking about? So I have a function called move it. Okay? I know it's a function because I the word before move it is def. So I've defined a function called move it and I have two arguments. I have list one uh, sorry I have two parameters, list one and list two. So I'm going to be passing in two lists and I'm going to move some things around. And then I want to return both lists. The way I do that, and what's one of the unique things about Python is that I can do this, is I just list those two variables separating them by a comma. I list 10 variables and separate them by a comma, however many I want. The corresponding call to move it is going to have two variables on the left hand side of the equal sign of the function call. And each one of those variables is going to get the value from the return of move it in the order in which they're placed. So again, this is positional. So I have one, two, three, it's going to be list one. I have four, five, six, it's going to be list two. I'm going to do some wonderful swapping here. I'm going to have 153 is going to end up in L1 and 426 is going to end up in L2. When I print L1, I'm going to print 153. And when I print L2, I'm going to print 426. So that is how it works, just like arguments and their corresponding parameters are positional. Multi-returns and the variables associated on the left-hand side of the, fun of the equal sign of the function call is positional. It's all positional. So return values are based on position in the return statement and are all passed by assignment. Unlike a lot of languages, Python allows this. This is one of the cool things about Python. In Java, I would have to put this into some kind of structure. In C++, I'd have to put it into some kind of structure on C as well. Um, but in Python, I don't have to. I can just um, pass things back. Makes it very easy. OK, so do I have that one? I hope so. Yes, here's the swap. Oh, that was list to swap. Uh, that's the number of pennies, the number of dollars. I don't have the other one. Okay, 
we're just going to go off to the labs. I'll make sure those challenges are, um, yeah, I'll make sure those challenges are up there. Also, one of the things that's going to be up there is this is lab 5.18 is something that you've done before, but now you're putting it into a function. And so lab 5.181 is just an introduction of how to do that. Now you're going to want to use the multi-return and you're going to want to accept a parameter and that's your money. And then you're going to do all the calculations for the number of dollars, number of quarters, number of nickels, number of dimes, number of pennies inside the function. And then you're going to want to do a multi-return that passes back dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, and then goes and prints. And I think that this confuses a lot of students because this is the first time you're going to have to kind of pull apart your code. But the break here is calculating the calculations for dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies is done inside the function. And the print statements are done outside the function. So inside the function is the calculation, the calculations that you want to do, and those are in the local scope. And in the global scope is where you're going to print. Um, so let's go through some of these. 5.18 is to swap values. Swap is a... Um, is a normal thing that you do. Everybody writes swap functions at some point in time. Because maybe you want to swap different things. Maybe you want to swap um, objects or values in objects. But basically what you do when you swap is you create a temp variable. You set one thing. You set the first thing to the temp variable. You set the second thing to the first thing. And then the second thing to the temp variable. And then you're going to return them. Part of this is that you're doing a multi-return. And if you're doing a multi-return, then you're going to have multiple variables on the left-hand side when you call the swap values function. OK, pseudocode part one for 5.19. 5.19 is complex. You have written this code before. Okay, I can't remember the exact um, lab that it was, but this is the exact same lab. What you're doing here is you're taking some of it and you're putting it into a function called exact change, and then you're returning the values that you calculated. So go back, get that code, especially if it was right, bring it into Zybooks, create a function, and figure out what's in the global and the local scope. So this is part one. This just tells you what's inside the function. So it'll be inside the local scope of the function. And then part two, which is a lot, is the if statements that you use to print out the values. These are identical to the if statements you used when you first wrote, um, when you first did this in three. In, in, yeah, module three. So that's what's important here. You have some things in the local scope because you're defining a function, and other things are in the global scope. Um, is there another one? Nope. You guys only have two labs this week. That's great. And again, all this will be up on the YouTube channel. Does anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. You all have a very good evening. I, w I should have this up by tomorrow at lunchtime around there, along with all the challenges and everything that we have done. So if nobody has any questions, I'm going to end the call and have a wonderful evening. And stay safe if you're in the storm area. Oh, yes, Connie, what's your question? And you can unmute Connie if you want. 
I start these classes around 9, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They are, I try and make them an hour, but I always run over. Um, and they are always recorded and put up on my YouTube channel. Do you need the URL to my YouTube channel? Yes, that, that should be on the email that the professor forwarded. Oh, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate you putting up the YouTube. No problem. And thank you. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, everybody have a good night. Stay safe if you're around the storms.